So we've got, we got some slides coming up on the screen. Uh, first slide will show you a little bit about the, the wedding in Cana. Um, we got that? And uh, these are some water jars, um, a bit like this. Um, yeah, put, put it back up for a second. Um, the, these water jars, you don't really get the sense of scale on them there, but if you were following the text as it went through, they carry 80 to 120 liters of water each. And one of those black bins that we used to have, that's about 80 liters. One of the wheelie bins, that's about 120 liters. So we're talking about six jars, as big as your wheelie bins, basically, filled with water. But they're not wheelie bins. These were stone jars that were meticulously made, lovingly made, with a special, uh, special technique to make them. Um, they were huge. And they were only used in priestly houses or really orthodox houses for ceremonial washing so that you were always right with God. So they would have been on display. They would have been prized possessions in the courtyard or, or under a canopy or something. And they were very special. We could only have water in them, which, of course, plot spoiler, uh, that's, that's going to go a bit wrong in a minute as we look through this. And um, so I want to start off, actually, uh, with the third slide, Abraham, if that's okay. Um, just flick onto that for me. Um, and I want to ask, why so much uh, water into wine? If you were to do the calculation, this is like the equivalent of a thousand bottles of, I don't know what your favorite Merlot is, or Sauvignon Blanc. It's probably neither of those things, is it? It's, this is exquisite heavenly wine, you know, Chateau de Jerusalem, 0031. It's just amazing, amazing wine. And why so much? And to, to illustrate what was going to go along, in my mind, you know, sometimes you have a vision that doesn't quite happen. But my vision I want to share with you, I was, I was going to have six large dustbins here, which I would have used a sort of a Jenny Mullally skill to make look into water jars. And I was going to get Joel there to run to and from the kitchen to fill up these, these jars during the sermon. And by the end of the service, you'd have seen water scattered all over the place. The church warden would have been annoyed with me. The carpet would have needed changing. Uh, but we would have had a sense of how epic a thing it was just to fill up these water jars. I don't know about you, when I, when I did Sunday school, I always imagined that the servants just picked up these stone jars, went down to the river, and then carried the water back in the stone jar. Did you imagine that? Anyone else? Yeah, well, Amelia did, yeah. And, it, and it, have you ever like, gone to Sainsbury's and picked up more liquid than you intended to? You don't have to explain which sort of liquid it was that you picked up. But maybe you picked up more milk than you intended to do, for example. And you're carrying it home, and you've got about, what, six litres? And your, your, your arms are hurting, aren't they? Imagine carrying a stone jar that's empty. And now I imagine a stone jar, 120 liters, they, they haven't moved at all. No one's moved these stone jars. The stone jars are stationary. Someone's had to go with a bucket to fill these things up. And then another bucket, another bucket. It must have taken ages. Can you imagine them? And, and all the while going, we're running out of wine and we're wasting time filling up these ceremonial, beautiful stone jars with water from the river. What's going on? So that's, that, that's what was going on. And why so much? Well, on the slide, there are a couple of references in the Old Testament and they're basically references to abundance that, that have to do with wine. So do you remember Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat? Anyone, anyone seen that play? Anyone sung Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat way, way back many centuries ago? You, you did it. I did it in the last century. Um, Jacob uh, prophesies at the end of his life to his son Judah, not to Joseph, but to Judah, which is the line Jesus comes from, the line of David, uh, that from Judah's line will be a king who can, <laughs> and Daz Ultra haven't seen this, who washed his garments in wine and his vesture, that's, that's his clothing, in the blood of grapes. I.e., it's not a literal technique on how to get your clothes clean, unless maybe white wine might be improved by it, but it's not a literal technique, but it's just a sense there'll be so much wine when this great king comes that you could just wash your clothes in it. And Amos, the great prophet who is prophesying at a time when things are bad for the people of Israel. He says there's going to be a come time coming when fortunes are restored so much so it's like wine is dripping down the mountains. Abundance, like abundance, loads of it. And Jesus churns a thousand bottles of water into wine. 
A thousand? It's a lot, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, I can find myself like alcohol can be a bit of a thing for me. I can like, you know, anesthetize myself a little bit with alcohol. So at the moment, I've stopped drinking for a while because it's, you know, it's not all that good for me. Um, but, you know, why does Jesus bring so much? Well, heaven, where we won't have the issues that sometimes cause us to be excessive that we are now, it's going to be a place where we're completed. You know, Bridget Jones' diary, those of you old enough to know that, you complete me. <laughs> it's just not true. <laughs> no human ever did that really to someone else. But Jesus does. Jesus completes us. And when we drink of his wine, it's a wonderful thing. It will fill us. He wants us to know that his provision is massive. So my first real question to us tonight is, do you know God who provides abundantly in your life? Is your God a God of abundance? Not long ago, Monique was looking for uh, some more hours of work. All right to say this one? I haven't checked. Should have checked. Um, she was looking for some more hours of work. We'll, we'll carry on with the story. That's all right. Got a nod. Um, and she approached Nicola and said, oh, any chance of working at church? Because she's fantastic. Do you know, she was the, the third stand-in to lead tonight. Uh, she's done a brilliant job, isn't she? But there was someone geared up to lead who had COVID, then someone else geared up to lead who had COVID, and then uh, Monique popped up half an hour ago to lead, and she's, she's doing an amazing job. So thank you, Monique. Um, but she said, you know, any chance of some work? And Nicola was like, well, we'd love to have you on team. Who wouldn't? She's amazing. Um, but, you know, money's too tight to mention um, at the moment. So what are we going to do? And then uh, uh, three of the people in church pray around St. Albans Church every week. Do you know the story? It's just an amazing story. They pray around the church and they bump into a guy who's not a Christian uh, who asks for prayer for his business. And uh, they, they pray for him in faith. Trust God will provide abundantly for this non-Christian businessman. Anyway, his business explodes. And he gets in touch and says, I'd like to give a gift to the church. And um, Nicola's like, well, you know, you don't have to pay God back for blessing you. And I said, no, I'd like to give a gift to the church. Said, really, really, let's have a chat and talk about it. You don't have to pay God back for blessing you. It's free. It's grace. And he's like, well, I'd, you know, I'd like to give 10 grand to the church. I said, oh, she changed her mind. <laughs> 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 no, that's not exactly true. They just said, like, you don't have to, but... Um, what, what do you want to give it for? I said, well, I, what we really want is to, you know, help young people uh, in the community and, and young adults in the community. And Monique, one of her jobs is to work in, in a hostel for, for young adults who don't have anywhere to live. And uh, she, but she also wanted to bring that gifting into church here. And, uh, and so we said, well, I wonder if this is the provision for Monique to do some hours here. Um, just a, f a few weeks ago, we, we, uh, well, Monique and I both worked for the mission agency SOMA UK, and we were facing a budget deficit of £28,000, which is a huge deal for our tiny little charity that has uh, Monique, me, Abraham, and someone else, and they just do a few hours a week each. Um, and we were like, oh, how are we going to get to the trustees? You know, we're going to have to close by the summer of 23 at this, at this rate. And then uh, someone knocked on my door and said, I've just been talking to my tax man, and they think I need to give money to charity. And I've been walking your dog. And uh, while I was walking your dog, um, I bumped into someone who said, you should give it to Richard <laughs> and Soma. And so here's a bunch of money. And it was enough money to sort of give us a, a month's booster in a charity. It was just amazing. God provides abundantly for us. Do you know a God who provides abundantly? You know, sometimes God puts money into your account and you don't need it. <laughs> and the joy then is you pass it forward. <laughs> Do you, do you know that? Have you learned that sort of technique? I remember when I was a kid, um, I had a building society account. Didn't have that much money in it, but the building societies got made something or other, and we all got a windfall. Those of you who are over 40 might remember that. And, and we, got, we got a certain amount of money. It was quite a large amount of money, but I didn't need it. Um, and I didn't need for it at all, so I cashed it and posted it through the church letterbox which completely freaked out the elders in the church. They were like, I think there's been a bank robbery locally and someone's <laughs> put some money into the church to sort of ease their conscience or something. I heard them chatting about it. Um, but, you know, I, I, just, I just gave it away. And then I went through university and God provided in all sorts of different ways for me at different times. Uh, sometimes I, I remember getting money under, in envelopes under my door and all sorts of gorgeous, lovely things. Uh, but then when I really needed money after university, I've been working on 50 quid a week for PGL Adventure Holidays, 
Um, I got a job for six weeks, which paid me, it was supposed to be for a whole term and pay me 7,000, but in the end, I only had to do it for six weeks. I still got paid 7,000 pounds. I had an abundance, which then paid for my gap year where I was earning 40 quid a week. And God just kept providing for me. And that went on for, for two years. And when I ran out of money at the end of it, because I'd given some of the money away to someone else to go on a mission trip, God provided to me through, through a trust. So sometimes he provided through envelopes through the door. Sometimes it was through applying to charities. Sometimes it was through work. But what I learned is Jehovah Jireh, which is the Hebrew for God will provide. And I learned to realize it wasn't my money. It was his money. Do you know, I started to learn that early on. Do you know why? Because I used to go to the Worthing Tabernacle FIC Church Sunday School. And in the Sunday school, they did a collection every week. And on the way in, my dad would give me one-tenth of my pocket money and say, in it goes, son. So when I was earning 50 quid a week later on, I'd take a fiver and I'd stick it in the middle of the week into the church little collection box. Because I'd learned it wasn't my money, it was his money. God provides. And I'm just getting to join in with the adventure of a providing God. Isn't it amazing? I wonder if you've begun that adventure yet for yourself. Here in John 2, Jesus takes pretty much nothing and turns it into a thousand bottles of wine. A few chapters later, he takes pretty much nothing, a boy's picnic, and turns it into enough to feed 5,000 blokes, plus a lot of women, plus a lot of children, and still have 12 basketfuls left over afterwards. The whole of John's gospel is about Jesus being abundant in his giving. And you have to tune in. How do you do that, Lord? How does your maths work? And the fact is, it doesn't work unless you've got faith and you trust him. But when you start stepping out and you trust him, it's like, whoa, <laughs> this is amazing. One less thing to worry about, hey? Because I put my trust in him and I'm following him. I'm following him. You know, um, one of the things that happens in this passage is that Jesus is going to ruin the ceremonial stone jars. <laughs> and lots of people talk about the fact there are six of them. I think there are probably six of them in the passage because there were six of them. <laughs> but Augustine and others say this is symbolic and it means a lot of things because six is the number one short of completion. It sort of represents the Old Testament covenant, if you like, rather than the New Testament covenant. And, you know, he may well be wrong, um, but he's St. Augustine, and I'm just Richard, so, you know. Um, but what Jesus does by making wine coming them is mean they can't be used for water again. But that's also what Jesus does right through John's gospel. He's like, you can't just have your old religion anymore. And in the old religion... The last words, practically, of the old religion in, uh, in Malachi. Do you remember the, the words in Malachi? There's a bit about not hating your daddy anymore. And that's an important bit. Um, uh, but, but just before that, there's a bit where he talks about, um, in tithes and offerings, you're under curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, that's 10% of your, your income, your bank balance, your your turnover into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord God Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So that's the old covenant. You bring 10%. And then he, he protects you. And the new covenant, we're beyond that. That's the old way. That's sort of the religious way. You sort of, you know, count out that bit's for you, that bit's for me, 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 that bit's for you, that bit's for me. But now we do what Levi's been singing about. We do, you are worthy of it all. <laughs> it's all yours, Jesus. That's the Christian way. It's all yours, and you make it good. So we don't give God a little bit of money, a 10% out of our bank balance. We go, this is all yours. 
how much am I allowed to spend on myself, Lord? It's all yours. What, what else can I use it for? You see, it's a totally different mindset. Because he is worthy of, not 10%, he is worthy of, it all. you see, it's different, isn't it? You were glad I didn't sing the whole thing, weren't you? <laughs> it's different. He's abundant. Right, second thing we want to pick up, and this is slide number two, please. And this is just, this is just quite funny, I thought, so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, this is Jesus talking to mummy. Um, now, I don't know what your name is for your mummy or daddy, if they're still alive and you get to chat to them. Um, what was your favorite name for them when, when you were younger, maybe, if you had a favorite name for them? Um, Mama, Dada. It, it, for Jesus, it was probably Abba, and I think Mama, I'm not sure. Um, Uma, uh, different, different names. Um, but, you know, if, I think if one of my kids was to go, Richard, <laughs> I'd be a little bit upset because, you know, I prefer to be called, you know, boss or sir or, <laughs> you know, dad, dad, or dad will do, dad will do. Um, but if it's just like, man, <laughs> it, it would feel like something's wrong. And here we've got Jesus, like the nicest bloke who ever lived, yeah, talking to a woman that he clearly adores, his mother, because when he's dying on the cross, he makes sure that she's being looked after by his best mate. Yeah? So it's not that he doesn't like this, this woman, he loves her. And then he goes, woman, to her. And so what's going on here? This is, this is just quite funny. And so she, she comes to him, and it, again, she's just called Jesus' mother in the text. And we know her name is Mary. Yeah, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, Mary um, says to Jesus, they've got no more wine. And uh, that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side is my sort of translation. Uh, and that's like, help, son, our friends are about to be shamed. Because if you run out of wine in that culture, it's just a big no-no. That's not great at all. Uh, so Jesus says, woman, <laughs> why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Like, what, I mean, it, is he just being sexist? Is he just rude? Is he offensive? What's going on? Well, here's my sort of translation. Jesus is like, Mom, I'm a grown man now. We're going to have to relate differently, my dear mother. Um, and by the way, I'm not the responsible one here. That's the bridegroom. Because the person who was responsible for sorting out the wine was the bridegroom. And actually, if Jesus rocks up and just said, Ta-da! here's Chateau de Jesus, uh, that would be as much shame on the bridegroom as, uh, as running out. Oh, look, someone else has saved the day. You know, you're not the hero of the day. Um, but he's also saying to her, and this is the key thing for us, uh, we're going to have to relate differently, dear mother. And because Mary has to do a journey that many of us have to do, and I'm not sure if all of us in the church will have done this journey yet. Because often what we invite people into is what Mary already had before this story. What's that? An amazing relationship with Jesus. She's already got that, hasn't she? I mean, he lived inside her for nine months. She has an incredible intimacy with Jesus. When she says, come here, he's done it. He's turned up at a wedding with her. He's actually brought 12 of his disciples along. You won't have seen it in the NIV, but the only person who got invited to the wedding was Jesus, and he's brought along a whole bunch of his mates as well. <laughs> That's not in the NIV, but he just rocks up with a whole load of people. No wonder they were running out of wine. He's brought 12 hungry lads with him. But it, Jesus and his mother, they've got a great, great relationship already. But that's not enough for Mary in Jesus' mind. It's not all he wants for her. He wants her to make the transition that I think many of us in church, in this nation, still need to make, which is to choose to become his disciple. His disciple, i.e. one who obeys him, one who follows him. See, the, the New Testament isn't actually about, would you like to have a relationship with Jesus? There's very little of that. The New Testament is, would you like to obey Jesus and be his disciple? And that's what he wants Mary to have. And that's, I guess, what he wants you to have tonight as well. Are you my disciple? Woman, why do you involve me? And she responds as a disciple. She doesn't talk to him directly, but she talks to the servant. She goes, just do whatever he says. She's got faith. It's 
She's got faith. She's not pushing, not manipulating, but she's got faith. She's a disciple, and she's under him, her son. <laughs> what a transition that must have been. Difficult one. And, of course, then Jesus tells them to do the water, makes it into wine, and provision comes. Provision comes bountifully, bountifully. Now, here in church, we always need God's provision, don't we? Um, and you are sitting in a living testimony to God's provision. The guy who was in charge of turning this place around 20 years ago died, died this week, a guy called Ian, who was the architect. Um, it's been a miraculous provision. And um, Ruth's going to come and, and tell us uh, how we can join in, in God's provision here in the years to come. Thank you, Richard. Um, well, you've got me this week, and I have the other church warden next week, and then me probably again the week after, because we're going to be talking for three weeks, just a little bit of time in the service, about giving. Um, and um, this week we're going to be looking at the principle of giving. Um, but I'd like to start with a couple of verses, if I may. And the first one is from Proverbs, um, chapter 11, verse 25. The generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And then the second one is from Corinthians, Corinthians 9, um, verses 6 to 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. So that sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? I love the bit that God loves a cheerful giver. Good smiling. <laughs> um, but the first thing I want to say is to th you know, a real thank you to everybody here who gives. And I'm sure a lot of people in, in the congregation here tonight already give. And without your giving, frankly, the church wouldn't be able to do everything that it does. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we use our money for next week. Um, but giving isn't really just about what we can get as a church and what we can do with it. Um, it it's really good for us as Christians to be able to bless and be blessed through our giving. Um, it grows us all spiritually. Um, and if we're honest, I think, it can sometimes be a bit of a challenge to make that step. Uh, if you've never given, if you haven't given regularly, it's sometimes difficult to make that first step. And I know I grapple with it for quite a long time. Um, but when you do that, you are serving God. And in the same way that loving our neighbor and other aspects of being a Christian are a challenge, then giving can be a challenge too, but it's part of our faith and we have to be faithful to that. Once you've um, been giving for a while, once you're a season giver, if you give sacrificially, again, that can be absolutely amazing. And we would love to hear any stories of people that have been really blessed um, through giving sacrificially. Um, and I remember, it, it seems to be whenever I do a talk or ever talk, you know, if somebody's asking and trying to raise money and I make that commitment to do it, almost immediately I get fired from one of my clients. I kid you not. And then there's that moment where I grapple with, do I take it back? Do I not actually give what I say I should have done? And I've tried and tried to step out in faith. And every single time, I kid you not, every single time, I get another client, and it's a richer client, it's a better client, and I am blessed more. Every single time, try it. Um, I'd love to hear your stories. I'll be around at the back of the church afterwards. I'd love to hear your stories because it's really encouraging when you hear somebody else doing it. Uh, it, it gives you that opportunity to, to reach out as well. Um, so we don't just give, however, to expect something back, do we? That's not right. But God promises, as we read, that uh, just that those who do so will be blessed. 
So we've heard from uh, John's gospel, we've heard from Richard about Jesus' abundant generosity, generosity to us. And in this time, we're looking at our giving. Uh, and we'd love you to think about what you could commit in your giving to the church. Please consider, if you don't already, if you can give for the first time. And it really doesn't matter how much you give. It, it can be a pound a month. It really doesn't matter. And as I was praying about this, I thought, you know, if Jesus said to you, would you take me for a coffee, Ella? You'd go, yeah, I'd love to take you for a coffee, Jesus. Maybe it's that. Maybe you're giving a coffee or two a month to Jesus. It can be as small as that. It's about getting into the habit of giving. And you may not have very much to give. That's absolutely fine. But I guess if Jesus said, could I have a coffee? He'd say yes. If you're, if you're already giving, that's fantastic. Just prayerfully consider about whether or not you can increase your giving at this time. And next time we're going to be talking about the practical ways that we use our money. But please don't delay if you have it on your heart to give, then we would love you to do that now rather than, than waiting. And we'd encourage you to sign up for um, a regular structured approach. And we've got, I don't know if you've all got one of these. This really tells you a little bit about how you can do that. And, and there are some, there's some comments there, just, just commitments about things that you might be able to think about and commit to. And we'd love you to spend a few moments perhaps after this to to, talk, to look at that and to commit to that. Um, I said, I'll be, I'll be at the back after the service, so any questions at all about how to give, um, any questions, stories that you've got about how you've been blessed, I would love to hear them. And uh, thank you, Richard. You carry, you carry on now.